All right. Uh, why don't we uh, Why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone had a, uh, a wonderful weekend. Just want to remind you all to please put your uh, name into the um, into the chat as uh, as we go. Uh, and also, um, as we as we hear the today's seminar, please put your questions as well into the chat. Um, what we're going to do is um, is stop and uh, and pause after the first section, and then we'll take the questions. Um, and I'll call on folks who, who put questions into, into chat. So um, I'm really excited today to, um, to welcome our speaker, uh, Dr. Jos Josue uh, Lopez, uh, who's an entrepreneur uh, with the mission of building scalable solutions to global challenges like autonomy and climate change. Uh, recently, Josue was a CEO of uh, Kyber Photonics, a startup developing LiDAR on a chip to enable autonomous machines, such as autonomous cars. Uh, uh, for navigation. Uh, that commercialization effort, uh, which was sponsored by uh, DARPA, the Defense Advanced Projects uh, Re Research or the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, uh, was featured in IEEE Spectrum and was aimed at meeting the very challenging cost, performance, and reliability requirements for that applications. Uh, Dr. Lopez attended East Los Angeles Community College, earned a BS in physics from Rice University, and an MS and PhD in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. And I think that we're gonna hear a lot about that journey in um, Dr. Lopez's uh, talk today. So uh, without further ado, let me turn things over uh, to Josue. Um, thank you very much for joining us. And we're, uh, we're all really looking forward to, uh, to hearing your story this, uh, this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me. And it really allows me to come full circle. And what I hope I can transmit to all of you today is that failure will definitely be part of your journey, but that's definitely okay. Um, and I've had to overcome now two major failures in my life and had to rebuild from it. Um, so I just want you to understand that wherever you're, you are in your journey, that failure is okay and that you will be able to get up from it and continue to achieve success. So there's there's two parts to this talk. First is kind of like my background, my story, um, and my educational journey. And then the second half will be about entrepreneurship. Some of it, uh, that story starts with my PhD at MIT and also Lincoln Laboratory. So that's why it's pretty awesome to be able to come like talk to you as high school students, because it combines like my journey, my personal journey starting from high school, than like my PhD in entrepreneurship journey that started at Lincoln Lab. Uh, so just a little bit about where I grew up. I grew up in inner city Los Angeles, specifically in the Linwood and Compton area, so LA. Um, I was you know, part of a community that was uh, mostly immigrant, um, Black Latino community um, that you know always cared about building community. And that was something that really impacted me in my life and the way that I kind of try to build community in my own life uh, at MIT, in Boston, and wherever I go. Uh, and so my parents immigrated from Guatemala. Uh, we're low middle income, didn't have much, but we we did have like a stable kind of childhood. Um, my parents, both in Guatemala, never got to go to college. So that was something um, that my parents always wanted to do. Uh, and what they did was transmit the value of education to my brother and I. So no matter what we did, uh, my, my mom and dad always emphasized the value of education uh, and how important that would be uh, to us and our success. And also how fortunate we were uh, to just have resources at our fingertips um, that they didn't have growing up. And so um, I took all those kind of like uh, community building effects um, and when I wanted to do that, I thought about engineering because I always loved building things. I always loved tinkering. I love building Legos. Um, and so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an engineer and translate technology into the real world. So um, my stage one of my journey was actually going to UC Berkeley. Um, it's kind of an exciting endeavor, leaving home. Uh, had never uh, 
you know, really left home before. Uh, and so this is going to be a big, bold experience for me. Uh, UC Berkeley, as you may know, is one of the top, if not the top public institution in the world. So it was very exciting. There was like 27,000 undergrads, all sorts of resources, a lot going on. So it was a very exciting time. And I went to the School of uh, Engineering at Berkeley, um, and I wanted uh, to really understand how the world works and I, how I could build solutions to kind of big challenges. Now, uh, this is actually like my first big failure, and um, I didn't recognize it at the time why I was failing or why I would struggle. But in the end, um, you know, for me, Berkeley was overwhelming. Classes were huge. Uh, I quickly got lost in kind of the 27,000 undergraduates that were there. I was intimidated by the Nobel Prize winners and the Fields Medalists teaching my courses. I remember struggling through electricity and magnetism my second semester at Berkeley. And that very, that very semester, my professor in physics wins the Nobel Prize uh, for detecting cosmic background radiation and how the universe kind of was kind of expanding. So I, you know, it was very hard for me to feel like I belonged. And then because I grew up in a predominantly Black and Latino neighborhood, uh, when I went to Berkeley, it was uh, very much not that. Um, you know, there were very few Black and Latino students, uh, very first first generation students, um, and you know, it was kind of hard for me to feel like I belonged and I had a community. So I really struggled. Uh, also because I couldn't find a mentor that was, or couldn't really connect with a lot of people and find the right mentorship that I needed. And so I struggled through courses and uh, people would say got weeded out. Um, you know, I felt like I was being plucked. Um, and that was kind of really, was, was you know, not succeeding in what I wanted to originally do. Uh, the courses and then eventually uh, that was a 1.981. And so I left on academic probation, but fortunately I had a friend that had gone to community college. And what she said was actually go back and rebuild yourself, go home and go to East Los Angeles Community College. College. And so I did, you know, I packed my bags, went back to like uh, Los Angeles and then found uh, ELAC. And there, um, you know, I, I knew that I, even though I failed initially, I wasn't going to give up easily. Uh, my parents kept on, you know, pushing me to pursue education. And I knew that I still wanted to make this impact on the world. So uh, I looked for support networks. Uh, I looked for a program called the Math, en Math Engineering Science Achievement Program, which is an initiative by the state of California. I sought out faculty um, in the mathematics department and in the engineering department. And that was the first time that I was able to like connect with faculty uh, because they understood my background. And moreover, because ELAC was a much smaller environment, you know, they had the time to be able to connect with me on a one-to-one -one level. And so I, I had another mentor, Professor Armando Rivera. He got a PhD at UC Irvine and was the director of the MESA program. And so what he would tell me when I would get worried about uh, my future and just kind of being anxious about uh, whether I was going to su succeed or not, he would say, uh, para de preocuparte y ocupate. Or he would say, like, stop worrying. It's going to be okay. Just keep on working. Keep on uh, taking one step at a time. It's all going to work out. Um, and so it did, actually. Uh, I remember my first semester in community college getting four A's and one B. So that was very different than what I had uh, experienced at UC Berkeley. And actually, not only that, I got to do research at Caltech through a Department of Education grant. So there, I actually got introduced to the whole world of research. Um, so you might have an idea of uh, research and science, and that's where I really got to uh, have my own kind of first experience with kind of 
basic science. And it was quite exciting. So I got to do research with, who's actually now the director of the Cali now, uh, solving big challenges in science. And you can see me in this kind of bunny suit working in the clean room where I was starting to work with advanced materials and advanced equipment. You know, things I had never experienced in my life before. And it was, it was kind of reinvigorating. And something I realized was that you didn't have to be a genius to succeed in, in science and engineering. Um, I actually got to publish research while as, a, as an undergraduate. Um, and that was kind of a recognition of, of my work and realized that you don't have to get straight A's to have impact on a real world. And then of course, uh, I set up uh, other mentors like Professor John DeBiri, John DeBiri who is now a Centennial Professor at Caltech and considered a MacArthur genius. And he was just very supportive through my time at Caltech as well. Um, and so one of the lessons that I want to try is it's really important to find role models and mentorship wherever you go and find people that you can connect with that are going to be supportive along your journey uh, because they will help you know, after I succeeded at ELAC, I transferred from uh, the community college to back to a four-year university, uh, which was Rice University. And there I continued to seek out other mentors. So for example, Professor, Professor Richard Tapia, who was National Medal of Science and the National Academy of Engineering, um, he demanded global excellence from his students. Uh, but he also told me that I was enough. Like I didn't have to be perfect. I didn't have to be number one. Being good enough was was fine because um, wherever you go, there are brilliant people that are going to be smarter than you are. Um, but you have to focus on your own journey. And he actually kept me from quitting physics because I was actually still struggling at Rice and I wasn't getting straight A's. I was kind of like a three, 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 four. And not, not number one. Really. And then I worked with uh, Professor of Physics, Jason Hafner, and was part of like other mentorship programs, like the Mellon Mays program that helped me continue to succeed during my time at Rice University. And so after four years, I graduated my, with my BS in physics and knew that I wanted to carry on with my career in science and engineering. So, um, you know, lesson number two, which is connected to lesson number one, was continue to find and or create a support network and a community that will continue to build you up as you go throughout your journey. And so um, now that I felt confident about myself and my abilities, I went on to MIT, uh, which is the top engineering school in the country or in the world, some would, would argue for engineering. Um, so I got to continue to do research in fundamental science and engineering. And um, it was very a great time in my life. Um, got to continue to push the boundaries of knowledge and myself and actually still struggled. Uh, but I had all these lessons learned from the other parts of my life and my educational journey that taught me that struggling was just part of the process. And, uh, you know, I took that and actually mentored students. So uh, during my time at MIT, I mentored several students. One was Chad Agunash, um, actually from the Red Lake Band of Chippewa Indians back in, in, in Minnesota. And that was a great experience for me. Um, I remember him telling me, that I have learned more with you and Mark in one summer than I have had in my, like all of my past experiences. And that was something that I st still carry to this day and meant a lot. And that goes to show that, you know, all your struggles and, and life lessons will one day serve other people as well. So I want you to understand that um, it may not be now, it may be five or 10 years, but you will have an impact on people's lives. Uh, and so one lesson I want to 
also convey to you is that you can pursue technical while also creating a supportive environment for those around you. Have empathy, have patience, and together um, you will grow as a mentor and other people will grow around you. And that will be very, um, very rewarding. And also like I made sure to continue to build and lead community. So I was president of multiple organizations uh, that focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. I work with students, I work with faculty, deans, uh, even the provost and president of MIT. And that was my way of giving back to um, you know, support networks that helped me achieve success earlier in life. And you know, I, was, I worked with uh, the Black Graduate Student Association and um, over the last three years, I've made sure to support like other groups, for example, um, Black Lives at MIT. And that's been re very rewarding because you want to make sure that you build as inclusive a community as possible. And so all of that led up to getting my PhD uh, this, this May in, in 2022 after eight long years. And so that was kind of a surreal moment. You know, this is me smiling with my department chair of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT, uh, uh, Sue, she's amazing. Here's me with my wife and my family and we're all smiles because it was a 15 year journey to get from, you know, UC Berkeley getting kicked out all the way to getting a PhD at MIT. And so something that I want to relate to you is also that grit is the most important thing um, that will have an impact on your success. So passion for what you're doing and also persevering through the challenges is the most important thing above talent um, and above other qualities. Grit will help you get through the tough times and uh, help you achieve your dreams. And so the summary of the three things that I conveyed, um, you know, for the first kind of 10 minutes of my talk, that role models and mentorship is crucial, unity for yourself, and that grit, which is passion plus perseverance, is the key to unlocking your success. And so, um, you know, for here, I'll, I'm happy to take one or two questions. And then I'm gonna get a dive into like my PhD research and how I started a company and kind of the lessons learned uh, that I've had there. All right, um, so uh, let's see. The first question, actually Bob asked the first question, but it was a question I was gonna ask. So um, rather than calling on Bob, I'll just ask, um, how did you connect with uh, your mentors? How did you find the mentors? Yeah. Um, so I would start by like online. So I remember when I would, um, well, let me start at, at ELAC first. There, I just knew that I needed And so I look, I asked and people would say like, oh, MESA. Um, it's like, okay, what's MESA? And it's uh, the Math Engineering Science Achievement Program. So I went, I would go knock on the door at the MESA program and the staff there and introduce myself and try to set up time, 15 minutes to talk to the director. And, and I built relationships and that's what I've done all around or said like, hey, I need help mention programs and support networks. And then I would literally go knock on people's doors uh, or send emails and sometimes one or two emails. Um, kind of the same thing at Rice University. Before I transferred, I heard about Richard Tapia's story. And so I reached out, I sent him an email, super excited. And then I made sure to go to his office kind of the first semester that I was there. All right, um, let's see. Um, Jaden Lee, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, so earlier you mentioned that you like how you got like, um, like you did research at Caltech. I was just wondering like how you exactly like went about getting that research position. Yeah, um, so it was actually very serendipitous. Um, I was talking to Dr. Rivera, who's the director of the MESA program. 
And I told him like, look, I'm very interested in PhDs and I want to do science and science research. And so he said like, hmm, I might have an opportunity for you. And because he knew I was doing well in, in, in school and had uh, this kind of very strong passion, he actually said like, I have an opportunity for you at Caltech. So it's like the people around you, your mentors that would kind of support you and promote you for opportunities like that. And other times I've gone ahead and like knocked down people's, uh, gone to people's offices like at, at Rice University or Caltech later on to connect with other faculty. Um, so it's, it's a mix of talking to your mentors and your supporters and also reaching out to people. And, and I've used both those things depending on uh, like my stage of career. Great, thanks. Um, let's see, um, Manya Dua, do, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, I was wondering, what did you do or what did you tell yourself when you felt like you know, giving up the process? Because what I've heard from this is it's been a long journey and um, that's, that's amazing, but I'm just wondering, um, what did you do? Like, what kind of motivation did you give yourself? And in other words, you were talking about grit and just how can we develop that grit throughout our journey? That's a great question. Um, one, I had one or two friends that helped, reminded, helped remind me that like I could still succeed. Um, so that's where the kind of support network comes in, like having friends and call that you can confide in, share your struggles in. And if they're good friends, they're going to support you, remind you that you're you're still great, you're still awesome, but you're gonna you're gonna you know get up from this um, failure. And then I would journal. I would journal like my dreams, um, talk about like my frustrations and my concerns and my anxieties. So I found that very helpful. Um, I also prayed um, because I, I uh, grew up in a religious household and I found that very comforting as well. And that there's actually a, a book called Grit by Angela Duckworth. So um, if you look up Grit, there's a book about it. I actually just finished reading it this summer. It's an amazing book and I highly, highly recommend it if you want to look uh, more into the subject of Grit. All right, thanks. And uh, let's see, Jessica Fu, I think you had a question. Yeah, I had a question. Like, what kind of like majoring in physics? What was it kind of like switching to um, electrical engineering uh, as a PhD? Kind of? Yeah, um, it was very natural, actually. Um, and I made that transition purposefully because I knew that physics would give me like a very strong foundation in basic science. You know, I would understand electromagnetics and quantum mechanics and just very fundamental concepts that kind of build up our universe. And then I knew that I wanted to do more applied research. So that's why I did an, an applied physics degree at MIT. Um, but that's formally under the electrical engineering and computer science department. And so um, I had a very good foundation and that kind of allowed me to build on top of that and then think about the applications and kind of the systems that you could build around it. Thank you. All right, um, I think those are the questions we have for now. Uh, great, um, and just to do a time check, how much do, time do I have for the second half of my talk? So I think we wanna go till about 1.25, uh, but um, maybe leave some, uh, including the questions because there's a, a small presentation at the end, but um, uh, so maybe leave uh, you know 10 minutes or so for, for questions to maybe target a, uh, another 15 minutes or so? Perfect. Um, so now I'll transition into kind of my PhD research um, and the company that I started from that research. And so um, most recently I was CEO, Chief Executive Officer of a company called Kuiper Photonics. And if any of you are Star Wars nerds uh, like myself, you will understand that Kuiper comes from Kuiper crystals that powers the lightsabers. So, you know, we kind of wanted to 
have that kind of inside joke for ourselves and some people uh, have really loved it. Um, so that goes to show that you can have some fun as well as you start your business. And the focus of Kyber Photonics was to enable autonomous machines to see the world through our advanced sensors. And that journey started at MIT uh, because we started to look at the needs of autonomy, autonomous vehicles, and specifically a sensor called LIDAR, which is short for light detection and ranging. And what LIDAR does is build a 3D point cloud of information that gives you very detailed information about the world around you. And so this 3D information, this XYZ positioning of bicyclists and vehicles and people around you allow autonomous machines to perceive and navigate the world and make decisions. And so the fundamental mechanism of LIDAR is to scan a laser around that 3D environment. And so just to give you a sense of what that looks like, this is a video courtesy of Velodyne, which is a now public LIDAR company to show you how powerful LIDAR could be. So as you can see, uh, lasers being scanned around that environment and you could get XYZ and velocity information from the world. And that allows autonomous and smart machines to make deci decisions. Uh, now, one of the challenges of LIDAR is that although it's very powerful, it has been historically very expensive. So the first Velodyne systems actually cost $75,000. More recently, they still have cost anywhere between expensive. Uh, they have been based out of mechanically moving parts, meaning that they break down over time. And because of the way they are built, they're simply not scalable to the millions of units that you would want if you truly want LIDAR to be ubiquitous um, in millions or if not billions of autonomous vehicles and machines. And so we started looking at that challenge as a MIT PhD in the research group that I And so we thought of that we could implement on a chip that would enable us to make it low cost because we could use something called integrated photonics, kind of like integrated circuits, uh, to build a LiDAR on a chip system. It's also solid, meaning it has no moving. And because we use a chip scale fabrication method, it means uh, we could make millions, if not billions of units in the future. So um, we had this tremendous insight with my, my collaborators and also people at Lincoln Laboratory. And the idea is kind of uh, hopefully simple if I relay it to you correctly. So imagine if you have a, a lens or actually a lens in, in two dimensions. And you have multiple or multiple lasers. And you have one laser that goes through the lens and goes in the forward direction. Or you, or you have a second laser coming off axis and you could go to the right or you could go to the left. And this would allow you to scan a laser at least in one dimension. And so you implement this lens by using different materials uh, that are used by the semiconductor industry. So for example, you can use silicon, or you can use silicon nitride, or you could use silicon oxide. These are all materials that you will continue to learn about in your engineering and science education. And you could build this planar lens that allows you to scan a laser in multiple directions. And so the idea is if, if you've heard of the concept of ray optics, you can actually trace the path of light through that lens and collimate it and scan it and steer it however you want. And of course, there's like technical terms like refractive index and uh, the constant speed of light and the phase velocity of 
of light in a medium, but I, I won't go into that, but this is just so you can get start uh, learning about all those technical terms as you continue on in your kind of physics, optics, and engineering education. And you could actually uh, simulate these. So we, you know, we wrote a program that could do the ray tracing and show that, you know, we can collimate a beam and also scan it. And we also did something called, L L we did electromagnetic simulation. So you could use a computer, set up this 2D simulation and then propagate waves through the, through the, the chip and the lens. So for example, you, if you have a laser source, um, the light will propagate in waves and then it, it'll hit this lens and then it'll be collimated. Uh, this kind of simulation is called finite difference time domain because you're taking very small differences kind of in the spatial map and then propagating these propagate over a certain time in your 2D simulation. And so here you can see if I shine light um, straight, um, straight through the lens, it'll go straight. And if I have a little off axis, then you could go to the left or you could go to the right. And so, as I said, it would allow you to scan a laser. And so this is the, the full setup of the design. So imagine if you have a waveguide with light propagating through it, it'll propagate, it'll hit the lens, and then it'll hit something called the grating, um, which is an element that will kick out light from the surface of an element. And it would essentially allow you to scan in two dimensions. So you'll learn about the polar or theta direction, the azimuthal direction, the, the polar direction, would allow you to go up, down, and then um, we would have the azimuthal direction or the, the in-plane direction, and that would allow you to go left or right. And so hopefully this at least leaves, at least gives you a kind of cartoon picture of how you, we can scan a laser in two dimensions. And so the amazing part of this design is that we could actually use uh, what's called uh, a microelectronics laboratory uh, which Lincoln Lab actually owns. So they have something called the MEL, which is the Lincoln Lab Microelectronics Laboratory. And they, there, they're able to handle eight inch wafers, just like Intel handles their wafers for producing microchips or Apple produces their own microchips. Lincoln has its own kind of fabrication platform to build photonic chips. So here you can see this very cool image of a Lincoln staff member that took um, of our very small chips that we fabricated during my time as a PhD student at MIT and group 89, um, with, uh, which is in division eight, was a very strong collaborator during that time. And you can see that these chips are about 10 millimeters. So you can see how small these photonic elements were, were on our chips and how we designed multiple photonic elements, like a grating and the lens and a switch tree right here that allows us to test and experiment our designs and see if it actually worked. And then of course, we, um, we published and presented it at um, several conferences because it was kind of a very novel design and um, had a lot of promise. And so again, uh, this kind of is a reference of how small those chips and designs were. And through my PhD, I actually tested several of these chips here. Um, and so just so you can see a little bit more of the components, here are some switches that allow us to move light around the chip. And then here's um, a lens and a grating um, that had uh, inputs from different, different waveguides. And this is the fundamental design that I showed you before in the presentation. And then we would connect this lens and this grating to this entire switch tree. Um, and you know, they're, these elements are very technical. It takes a lot of work to develop, but I hope you get a sense that you can create photonic elements on a chip and it allows us to move light around for, um, for different designs. And so here during my PhD, I actually fiber coupled the laser 
into one of these waveguides. And I hope you can see that we could actually scan a laser in one dimension. So here I have an infrared camera where I'm showing uh, you know, me using a laser going through each waveguide. And then if you look in the forward direction, if I use the infrared camera and scan it um, along each port, I can go from right to left. So again, this is an infrared camera capturing what's being emitted from the chip and then being reflected back. And then you could also scan a laser or change the wavelength or change the frequency of that light uh, from 1500 to 1600 nanometers and you could go in the up down direction. And so this is kind of the fundamental concept of uh, what LIDAR is based off of. You need to be able to scan your laser uh, in multiple directions and emit it and receive it back and get information from the real world. And so this is just another demonstration, kind of a, a more recent demonstration of a 32 port system where I have 32 individual waveguides. And you can see we have a very smooth scanning from right to left and up down. And so this was a very satisfying result and actually took us about you know, two years from design all the way from experiment. And it's actually taken, taken me about four, four years to fully digest all of the performance metrics of these particular designs. Science. And so, um, you know, we had a very exciting technology and actually with the support of a lot of IT resources, we actually decided to form a team for a startup. So uh, Lincoln Laboratory and a lot of programs at MIT and other, other incubators or accelerators supported us as a startup team to go out and spin out this technology and get the resources and advisors and infrastructure we needed to be able to um, spin out this technology. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, we had to think of a market. Where can we sell this product? Uh, where are customers that really need this technology? And so we thought about autonomous vehicles, for example. So you've probably heard of Waymo already or Voyage, um, you know, Uber and Lyft have had a lot of initiatives and autonomy as well. Um, I think I'm getting a little bit of echo, by the way. Um, sorry about that. But we had other companies thinking about autonomous vehicles and autonomous machines. And so we had our market and then have built a team and a company around the effort of selling um, our products to these customers. But that all started with kind of very small steps. Um, so we filed uh, a provisional patent during my PhD and then had done a preliminary systems analysis of a potential LIDAR system and kind of learned a lot through that process and realized like, oh, there's a lot of still hard engineering work that needs to be done before we can move from this first demonstration that we did during my PhD and um, go to kind of a beta demonstration with customers. And we also had to talk to a lot of people. So um, in 2019, we talked to like 30 plus potential customers, you know, talking to people from Tesla and Ford and Voyage and Cruise and kind of really heard kind of the pain points of customers. And we realized that to be successful in a company, especially a startup, you need to talk to a lot of people because um, the first idea you have for a potential product may not actually feed the needs of your end customer. And so that's taken us kind of a two year process. There have been a, a, lot, a lot of steps Chief, um, um, for like two years, we did a lot of work. So we um, did a, a programming at MIT called the Sandbox. And then we actually entered the, the ISN MIT Lincoln Laboratory Soldier Design Competition. 
And then we did more competitions at Arizona State University and got some grants there to continue to build on our ideas. And then we applied to this big fellowship that gave us about half a million dollars to go out and continue to prove out our technology. And that was in 2020. And then we continued to work with MIT as I was a PhD student still to continue to make progress on the technology and build a business plan. And through all that, continue to build momentum. Um, and so we actually got to publish a pretty cool article in IEEE Spectrum in kind of December 2020. So if you Google Kyber Photonics um, and LiDAR on a chip, you could actually find that. So if you want to learn more, I would encourage you to do that. And then all through that, like customer discovery and there's an accelerator work. You know, we, we showed that we have a, we had a LiDAR engine and that we had software that could get signal processing. And then finally, in, in kind of early summer of 2021, we incorporated the company. So I started this research in 2017. We had these cool results. And then in 2019, you know, I, I, I realized, hmm, maybe I want to do the startup life. And then it took another two years to be able to finally feel like we could, um, you know, attempt this in the real world. And so I hope that kind of shows you also that even though you hear about Silicon Valley and startups and kind of all this excitement, that it takes a, lo a lot of work and a lot of grit and a lot of perseverance and team building to be able to, to at least have, um, to reach what's like um, escape velocity and kind of go out into the real world. And so, as I mentioned, you know, we had some major news in IEEE Spectrum, you could check it out. Um, but what I wanna leave with you from all this is the kind of three key lessons is that entrepreneurship, just like your academic journey, just like my PhD, will take a lot of work. Um, second, team is everything. Uh, even though you will go through your educational journey, kind of focused on your exams and getting you know, straight A's and doing research or your internships, I want you to remember that you can't do everything by by yourself and you cannot be perfect at everything you can be good at some things and great or excellent in one or two things and then you will need to build a team around you that complements your tasks um, both on the, the knowledge front but also on the business front and so you need to work with other people to actually achieve big things and the third thing um, I want you to learn is that startups will fail. They actually fail all the time. And we actually decided to shut down our company after two years of working on it. And we're actually at peace with it. We're okay. Um, it was uncomfortable. We had a lot of advice. It was very challenging, but we've decided to learn that that was okay as well. And so um, I hope you start seeing a theme that through your journey, you will not meet all of the expectations and all of your goals. And that's perfectly fine and part of the process. And so now I'm happy to like unpack that and take any questions that you may have. Thank you, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, so let me call on a few folks for questions. Um, Aishwarya uh, Udeshi, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I was wondering how your idea itself uh, developed throughout the process and if you had to tailor it to meet your customers' needs. Yeah, and are you asking about the PhD process or the business startup process? The business startup process. Yeah. So we learned that before you actually build your next demonstration, the customer discovery is a key part of that. And so you have to talk to like 50 people to, come, to talk about what are the technical requirements they need. So, you know, does it have to go look 200 meters? What is the scan rate uh, or the refresh rate of the LiDAR system? 
Um, and what's the resolution, the kind of the spatial resolution that you need. And so that was very important for us to iterate on paper and create a, a spec sheet for what we wanted to build. And then that would guide kind of our technical process. And then on the kind of the R&D side, um, you, you still apply kind of the, the basic fundamentals of like experiments and science. You have a hypothesis about kind of the design you need, and then you run a simulation, you build it, you test it, and then you measure that, and then it gives you more, uh, more feedback for the next design. So I hope that kind of gives you insight both on the product side and then kind of the the R and D side that we needed to do to meet those customer requirements. And uh, just to follow up, so did your idea like when you first envisioned it, and then later down the line, was it a lot different or different at all, or was it pretty similar? It was similar, um, but it. We definitely had to revise a lot. So let's say the fundamental architecture and our design was was kind of the same, but the act specifications were different. And then we also learned that there was a big gap between what we had now as a proof of concept and what would would actually be needed for a customer. So we still needed kind of like another order of magnitude improvement in kind of the laser and improvement in the switch tree and improvement in the kind of photonic performance of our system. So it goes to show that uh, kind of the, the fundamental idea could be the same, but you still need a lot of work to be able to execute it into something that is actually useful. Thank All right, um, let's see, maybe we'll take a couple more questions. And uh, oh, great, thanks. I was just gonna suggest that you uh, yeah. stop sharing this. Um, it's fantastic. Um, Meta uh, Venkatapathy, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, so what were the chips wires made of? Were they made up of fiber optic cables? You could think of them essentially as miniature fiber optics. So fiber optics are as well made of like silicon and silicon oxide. And so those waveguides that I showed before, guides that you could build chip, uh, those waveguides are actually um, no bigger than uh, 1,000 nanometers, right? Um, so it's like one micron wide, which is actually, you know, thinner than a strand of your hair. Yeah, um, to follow up, how did the wires align the light that wasn't um, directed perfectly without absorbing it? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, so we used a material called silicon nitride, which absorbs very little light at the right wavelength. So at 1500 nanometers, Silicon nitride is actually a very good material for propagation. And so um, just as you're thinking, you need to match the right wavelength with the right material. And then of course, there's kind of some geometry for that waveguide that you need to include to make sure that you lower your losses as well. And then part of it is also the fabrication process. You need to improve the fabrication process time and time again to be able to reduce those losses. So actually very good technical question. Okay, um, let's see, Eric Chen, would you like to ask your question? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I had a question. So as you said, you've had many challenges and you had to persevere through a lot of difficulties. What was your motivation to like keep going and just not give up? Uh, essentially, I had a chip on my shoulder. Uh, I wanted to prove to folks that I was worthy, I did belong. Um, and I knew fundamentally, I wanted to have an impact on the world and I knew that I could do cool things with engineering and science. So I knew I could do that. I still had that passion. I wanted to have impact on the world and the community I grew up in. Um, so having kind of that passion, that vision for the impact you want. And then it's not bad to say like, I wanna to prove to others that I can succeed. And then hopefully what I wanted to do is also be an example. So like 15, Years ago, I told myself, I want to be an example for other students that kind of fail. 
And I want to make sure that they understand that it's okay. And so they can learn from my life and hopefully like avoid some of my mistakes, but also feel like failure is part of the process and that you could actually achieve your, your dreams if you have the right support network around you. All right. Um, I think we have time for maybe just one one last question. Um, and let's see, I'll, I'll ask uh, Wayne uh, Folfak um, to come up and ask your question as the last one. And sorry to anyone who I, I didn't have time to call on. Yes. So you mentioned your startup earlier. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, when you're starting a startup or engaging in any kind of entrepreneurship, what level of risk do you think is acceptable to take on? It's a very good question. Um, and I actually think risk is a concept you should apply to your life as well. So risk mitigation, or also just accepting different thresholds of risk is a main concept you will uh, have to play with around in your life, different dimensions. From the startup perspective, uh, it definitely is all about reducing risk. And so there's four elements actually um, to, to a startup. There's the technical risk, there's the market risk, there's the, the team risk and the financing risk. And so you need to think about each one of those dimensions and make sure that not all of them are kind of in hard mode. So if you know you're playing like Halo in playing God mode or like the most difficult mode, you want to make sure that you're not playing all of those, all those dimensions in, a, in hard mode or God mode. It's not going to work out. You need usually like, there's going to be one thing that's super challenging. Like for us, it was, I would say kind of the market was very hard. The technical was very hard. The team financing, we felt a appreciate the correction. Um, and so I think you need one or two of those things to be like in one in legendary hard mode and then the other need to be like me because otherwise you can't succeed and that was actually why we decided to shut down the company so after two years we had experimented we had tested our hypothesis um but fundamentally like our technology was going to take twice the amount of time and money that's fine but then uh the market became very crowded there was like six public companies in the lidar space so the opportunity was no longer there and then uh, from the financing part, you know, we're talking about recessions and big things like that. And so the risk profile of investors changed. And so with all of that, we decided like, okay, we've tested our hypothesis. Things are kind of going to be in legendary mode for, for three of those things. Like, okay, I think it makes sense to wrap up, take those lessons and move on to the next big thing that we want to work on. All right. All right thank um, you. Um, and uh, Wayne, don't, don't, don't go anywhere. And I, I'd like to also invite... Um, Kate Wang up, um, uh, the two of you, I think, have a, a short little presentation, so go ahead. Yeah, um, so I can start. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Lopez, for speaking to us today. It was absolutely fascinating to hear about your story. That was um, very varied and at times quite tumultuous. Um, and I think I speak for everyone when I say I think it's really valuable for us young engineers and scientists to hear about these difficult experiences to like understand that um, most, if not all successful people have struggled and like what they have learned from those struggles. And when it comes to your um, technical achievements uh, as a programmer who doesn't really have much experience in electrical engineering, just learning about what you were doing with photonics and the downscale lighter sensors was really enlightening. So thank you. Um, Bunny can continue. Uh, yeah, I found your story really inspiring really and how even after failure, it's important to keep persevering. And that sort of thing is just something that really inspires me and really motivates me to keep on improving. So thank you for that. And so we wanted to present you with this Beaverworks t-shirt. Oh no, it's blurred. I'm wearing it right now. Yep, Kate can show you, can show you there it. There you go. Yes, uh, I don't know if you've already gotten it yet. It's still blurred on my end, but uh, yes. I have, uh, and I'm excited to wear it. I actually just uh, uh, washed it so I could like wear it really fresh. That, Perfect. Uh, um, 
And so no wrinkles and everything. So I'm excited. Uh, and also just want to thank you for just like allowing me to be here. It's kind of really a gift to be able to do this because 15 years ago, like I couldn't have imagined doing this. Uh, so really heartfelt thank you. Yeah, and and Josue, thank you so much. Um, I, I know I speak for everyone here. I really enjoyed um, uh, not only the inspirational personal story of, of you know some of the challenges, but also um, uh, how some things don't go well, but overcoming uh, overcoming them. But also just hearing about uh, your, your technical story with your company was really fascinating. So thank you so much. And um, if I could ask. Um, you know, everyone in the program to, to stay on just for uh, a couple of announcements. And uh, Josue, thank you again uh, so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And so good luck, best of luck with your educational journeys. Um, find your mentors, support network, build community where you are, and then find what drives you uh, and you're going to make that difference. So have a good day, everybody. Thank you.